Welcome to this edition of Partners for Community Living. I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of background if it's been a while since you've joined us. Partners for Community Living is the partnership between two nonprofit residential providers located in the Miami Valley area. One of our agencies is the Resident Home Association, which has been providing services since 1966, one of the first uh, private agencies in Ohio to provide such services. And then our other agency is Choices in Community Living, and it's just a youngster having been around just since 1985. And on behalf of uh, all of those we serve, our board members and our staff, we welcome you to, uh, to this edition, and we hope that you will uh, uh, sit down on a couch, maybe get a cup, cup of coffee or a cup of tea on a dreary day, and, and spend a little bit of time with us as we, uh, we talk about what's the most essential thing for most of us and that's being a part of a family. And we're going to talk about uh, being mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and being friends and neighbors and members of a community. Uh, I want to start out, um, I'm going to read just a very short few lines. Um, there's, a, there's a new book out and I'm not uh, going to promote it too much because of the name of the author on it, but um, we, we think that it's an extremely important book, especially right now in, in such unsure times when um, there's fear for and uncertainty for some of the people that we serve. Um, the book is called Home from Purgatory, Freedom, Choice, and Life After Christmas in Purgatory. And I want to read one short uh, segment for, and then we'll introduce our panelists. At my baby's funeral, one of my husband's friends came to me and said he was sorry that I'd lost my baby. And then he nodded over at Chuck and he said, it's a shame that she died and he's still here. I didn't understand what he meant. And so I said, what's him being here got to do with her dying? And he said, it's just a shame that your baby died and the retarded kid is still here. That's the reality that Julia had to live with and in some ways still lives with. And most of us can only imagine as mothers or grandmothers or uh, aunts or sisters or friends what it would feel like to have those words said to you. Our, our two guests, they, they don't have to imagine. They may not have had those exact words, but they've had words very close to that said to them. And so they come with great authority here as, as mothers. So um, I'd like to introduce Wynema Mebbin and Sandy Neergarter. Um, they are uh, first and foremost mothers. They are, are mothers of uh, sons who have disabilities, who had developmental disabilities. Uh, if we, and I'm going to introduce them for uh, the organization and the advocacy that they were involved in. But first, I, I want to focus a little bit and, and follow up on what Julia said and before we get to where, where you are as advocates, what were some of the first things when you first heard about your sons? What, what were some of those things that kind of formed who you were, all, were and your family was when you were told that your child had a disability? Well, I think I can tell a, sh a small, a short story on I had the misfortune of finding out there were no available services for um, my son in Montgomery County existing at that particular time and my son is 49 years old and um, having to find the proper physicians and diagnosis and all of that we were led to go outside of Montgomery County and we had our diagnosis in Cincinnati and it was at the University of Cincinnati, and I'll never forget her as long as I live, Dr. Rubenstein. And she was well known for uh, dealing with children with uh, disabilities and, and the process of disabilities. But in finding out, it was, it was a shock. But then I felt as though that in some ways we were chosen. Um, I took it in such a way as to see that he was not doing the things that were uh, that normally would be uh, acting and behaving the way that he should be or what we thought our normal children were doing 
and sometimes I question what we knew then as normality because he wanted to just be loved and we just didn't know how to provide that because of the behaviors that came with it. And I must be grateful enough to say that he wasn't a child that would fall out on the floor and kick and scream and everything, but he was a child that was more complacent and he would bite and he couldn't get his words mm -hmm. out and consider what was what's considered nonverbal. But by going to Dr. Rubenstein, we were led into a position where she did a diagnosis after one year, but that one year was costly, driving back and forth once or twice a month just to see a doctor. Until one day, I found that I was sitting in the doctor's office in Cincinnati, so far away from home, take, with one child on one arm and one baby in the other arm, and sat down beside a mother that had a child and I said, what a pretty baby, can I see your baby? And she uncovered his face. And when she uncovered his face, there were no eyes. And suddenly I learned the biggest lesson in my life, that I was not the parent that had the worst situation that ever had to be faced because there was a mother <laughs> there that had to wish that her child no, didn't have a disability but also had sight. And I learned from that and immediately, I don't know where it came from, but I do know that there was an opportunity that was presented my way by a legislator. And I called some people and I called Chuck Whalen, who at that time was one of the most well-known legislators in, in Columbus. And I just gave it my all. I cried and I cried. And with the assistance of a woman that used to be in Montgomery County, Georgia Ann Matthews, Yes, I was directed I into my first steps into advocacy. And for that reason, my son stands tall today and he isn't nonverbal, but he can tell you what his needs are and he can move, advance himself into the community and he does quite well. And Sandy, I know your, your story is a little <laughs> different as every parent's story is yeah. different. My son had a brain tumor when he was a baby. And um, <clears throat> once it was removed, um, he didn't progress like a normal baby does. So we finally took him to Children's Medical and he was diagnosed and the doctor, bless his heart, came out and said, your son's a vegetable. You should put him in an institution. Well, we decided not to do that. So we took him home, lost a whole year of having time to do something with him because there was no services. And we finally took him to Children's Medical. And this doctor said, no, we don't have anything for him. Lost another year. Finally talked with my doctor Goes, there's got to be something in this community for this child of mine. He says, well, there's Children's Medical. They have physical therapy over there. I said, I was over there. They told me they didn't have anything. He said, well, go back. So I went back, and they did. And that's when I got mad, because <laughs> I had lost all that time that my child could have been getting help. And that's when I knew, if I didn't do it, nobody was gonna do it for my kid. And tell us, what, what time frame are we looking at here now when, when we're talking about the lack of services and all? What years? I was back in the early 60s. Early 60s. And, and for me, it was, it was in uh, the late 60s. But mine went on as well for up to two to three, about three years mm -hmm. in just trying to figure out where we were going. And let me just say this. My son was born uh, brain damaged and also had uh, an MR. And that's mental retardation, which is a word we don't use don't now. Don't use yeah. anymore because, yeah. because of some of your My son was born with word. a developmental yeah. disability. Right. And right. I say that with a smile because change was made. But in, in the year and the time that we were in, there was no directives for doctors, for the community, mm -hmm. for, for policemen, for those that could make change had no idea what the average family was up against in those days. When I, and I can remember getting a knock on my door when he, Jeffrey was about maybe nine. Caseworker from the county board came mm -hmm. and she says, well, why isn't your son in school? I said, what school is he supposed to go to? She says, they don't have schools for my son. 
She said, oh, yes, they do. And I said, well, then why didn't somebody tell me before now? So that's when we found out that there was a county board provided educational services for kids like my boy. But that didn't start till about 1969. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you lose all that time. All, all that, that time. developmental mm -hmm. time is lost. Mm -hmm. And it I, makes you mad. Mm -hmm. I was directed to, uh, uh, through Mrs. Matthews, she used to come and take my son home with her just to give what was called a respite break because he did sometimes cry 24 hours. But there was something that families were invited to do even when we didn't know about the facilities that they could go to. And every child born with disability at that time couldn't just go just anywhere. If you didn't get a doctor from Children's Medical, you had to go outside of Montgomery County. If you had needed services, you had to go. If you didn't need speech, you had to find a speech specialist. Yeah. Those things were non-existent to us. And specialization was just not there. But I was with someone that led me to develop a plan called the Yale House. And it was on Yale Avenue off of Salem Avenue. And that was the beginning for families to step out and come together. And there was only about five of us at the time. And we did book sales and we did different things. And the county provided a facility. But it took a directive from someone in the county that wanted to go beyond the level of a job and do a little bit more to help families. And let me tell you, 38 years that woman gave, um, George Ann Matthews gave her life to families with disabilities, but she also was a catalyst as a jump off start for people like me that had no idea what was to come. Right. And the future was scary. And she, she like so many who dedicate so many years are, are professionals, but they're really true advocates. Committed. But the, the truest advocates, and, and all of us who call ourselves advocates in one form or another know that the real advocates are the parents yes. and the families, and that uh, we wouldn't have any services we have today with, without some of, the, so uh, some of those pioneers, and it was in the 50s and everything. And it leads us to you know, some of the first forming in the 50s of uh, what they called the Association for Retarded Citizens mm -hmm. um, and at a national level. And then they, they came in locally and there were uh, most counties, and, uh, there would be a state ARC as they were called and there would be local. And I can remember um, in, into the early 80s there was still a functioning ARC chapter in this area in Montgomery County. Um, but again, it fell into disarray. Um, and so that source of that advocacy of that, like it's say, you know, we do it because we, we're driven by a certain thing, but a mother's love and a father's love, it's like you said, you get mad. I do. And you make things, you know, yes. and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a justice mad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a right mad. It's not a, like getting angry with no, the average it's, it's person. No, it's not an anger. You're, it's you're a, it's frustrated. Like, it's that, you know, yeah. it's that push to, yes. to make something happen. So uh, uh, there was really, for so long, a, a really void in this community mm -hmm. when, uh, when there weren't the voices of the families and everything right. and uh, uh, to fill that void. And so one of the reasons we, we have you on the program now is to talk about advocacy and especially from a parent level because we're going to have uh, a celebration of advocates and advocacy um, on November 9th. Um, uh, Partners for Community Living is um, holding our annual John W. Pratt Society um, Legacy Award uh, which uh, honors an individual or a group that uh, provides lifelong dedicated uh, service and achievement on behalf of people with developmental disabilities. And the recipient for 2017 is Miss Wynema. And, you know, in celebration with all her family, Sandy and all the families Friends. that came together. And I guess we probably would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about John Pratt and how he got in there <laughs> yeah. in the first place because uh, the people who knew, knew John Pratt, if you say his name, you still smile. Mm -hmm. Uh, good man. Good, a, a good, good, good man. Mm -hmm. He was a, a very hardworking businessman, uh, a husband. Father. A father, you know, a, a good uh, member of his church. Had four daughters, and one of those became Susie, <laughs> <laughs> who became the challenge and, uh, and the love of his life. Right. Uh, and the love of his, uh, you know, his late wife's life. And John took all of that know-how and all of that 
perseverance and all that persistence and the people he knew and the network mm -hmm. he had. And boy, did he go after it. Right. He, he went after it in the community. Um, as we talked about, I introduced Resident Home Association. They began because families yes. came mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And John Pratt was one of those families. He helped found both Resident Home Association and Choices in Community Living. Mm -hmm. And I can remember uh, when Brenda Whitney was with the Resident Home Association, her talking about those first, before there was any state funding, right. before there were state rules and regulations, and the people were coming back, primarily from Orient, because mm -hmm. that was the, the uh, institution that people from this area were uh, taken to, and how families would come in and actually clean houses to get them right. ready, would paint the houses, would bring food in. Right. And sometimes they would have months when they did not have enough money to cover the electric bill and families would pay the electric bill. Right. Um, and the and, families would bring in the furniture. And bring furniture and yeah. and all of those kind of things. So, uh, you know, and John Pratt served, of course, many, many years on the county board of developmental disabilities, um, uh, was active politically uh, and lobbying and on a lot of things. So, uh, and at the time that John was uh, was in the hospital on his final days, I remember he loved Partners for Community Living. Mm -hmm. and, and if he loved you and he thought you were really doing well, he would tell you how much he loved you and, and how he appreciated what you did. But boy, if you <laughs> if you were yes, doing that. something wrong, he he could tell you that too. But uh, but he called, you know, just a few days before he died because he was trying to set up an endowment for us, and he just said. He called and talked to me personally. He said, now, have you got this done, this done, and this done? And I would say, yes, John. He said, now, you don't let this go. You know, right to his last breath, he was an advocate. Mm -hmm. And so he meant so much to so many of us that, that uh, we chose to honor him with uh, naming the, our Legacy Society right. for our endowment uh, after John. And then what better way to keep his legacy alive than right. to honor people right. like Wynema and, and, and Sandy and all the... Uh, the ladies that have come before and that they, the recipients will come again. So we do invite people to join us there. They can come to the women's, uh, down at the Dayton Women's Club on November 9th at 5.30, we start. And if you want to come and join us and see what advocacy looks like and meet some of the great advocates, you're welcome to do that. Um, we invite you to come and be a part uh, of our family and our community and you can become an, uh, an advocate as well. I'll teach you. Yes, uh, and we we want we wanted uh, Wynema and, uh, and um, Sandy to be here because they too have a you know a, a story and hopefully we'll get here and before some of our time runs out about in in this um, home from purgatory which is available now through <laughs> partners so we'll we'll keep giving that a kick. You did a good job on that. Oh, well, great th thank job! You, thank Kudos. you. Kudos. And uh, but the and because they are a part of that great uh, celebration that. Um, uh, that we're going to have on the night. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, we can sit down and we can uh, we can map out our lives, and we can decide what what things are going to go. And, and for the most part, we can make it happen. And you choose the path you take. But you sit here, and there are there's John Pratt, and there's Wynema, and there's Sandy, and there are people like Eunice Powell, and Fran Watkins, and the great ladies. Uh, Joan Thompson and uh, mm -hmm. and all of the great ladies and, and great fathers, and sometimes the path chooses you. Yes. And you see so two true. ladies sitting here, that the path chose you. And I don't think the day your sons were born, you were thinking you were going to be advocates. <laughs> you were thinking you got, we have another child to take. Right. We have another child. I've got to go home and take care mm -hmm. of this baby. And little did you know, you had to go home and take care of that baby. In, in ways that you never thought of. So uh, uh, to, to be able to, to honor you and to have you on this program tonight. Um, uh, what were some of the early, I, I know you talked about not having services, but um, what would, once the services started, and I say the 1969 when the county board started, mm -hmm. what were some of the challenges for families? I mean, as, as you were struggling and, and you did find services and all, but what, what were the challenges you faced, not only in the systems, but in the community as far as understanding and acceptance and those kind of things? What, what was it like to have a six or a seven or eight year old that in that, during that time? I, 
I would, well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for the nomination for the, <laughs> and, and, and partners. And I am honored to be in such a company because I sit across from another advocate that has been committed to this program, and that is Miss is Judy. And we have a little thing we call her Miss Judy, but it's <laughs> Judy. And we are, I am so honored, but I, I feel like I'm in good company because I've learned so much. And to tell you, the first thing is fear. You don't know what's to come. Fear the unknown. Um, feeling lost. Why me? You know, a lot of why me's. And it did, took... Did I do something wrong? Yeah, what did oh, I ever the do, guilt. Did I I do something for this to happen wrong. to yeah. me? Say. Yes. The, the, the need to have that answer, right. so what did yeah. I do wrong? And, and I personally had proof because I had uh, one child before, and my son was born in the middle. And so I'm thinking, okay, now I lived with someone that had polio. So I grew up with a little bit of it, and I thought, what did I ever do to her that this would happen to me? And so you compared the two situations, but it didn't have anything to do with it. It took me a long time to find out. But I also had to live with a little bit of pity because I thought, am I going to be able to do this? Am I the one to do this? Can I carry through? Can I take this charge that's been put before me? But I have to tell you something. I've told a lot of people, and I've spoken before a lot of crowds and, and workshops, where I've told people I was chosen. And then I say it with a smile, and they say, why are you smiling? Because I had to tread through some deep water, and I say that deep. And I also had to find out where did he fit in my life, but where was he going to fit with others? And then the challenge of protecting him came forth. And I have to say that the footprints that I didn't know was that of John Pratt's. I feel like I am so fortunate in the 43, 45 years that I've been doing this, that I came upon some good educators. And they didn't give me time to sit on a pity pot. And I say that in such a way that it was that remorse, that feeling of being overcome, that feeling that I had to be so much stronger than anyone else and move this person forward. And then I had to come up with what programs fit? And then once he fit those programs, what people was I putting his, him in their hands? And it was not easy because we had to overcome our first fear, and that was us. Can we be good parents? And I think that the one thing I can say with Sandy as a partner, and we've had 40 years together almost, <laughs> we have actually been friends. And I'm so proud because I've learned from her. And I've learned that she had, was in an area where I couldn't go. And I've been in a place where she couldn't imagine. So we've shared those stories and shared yeah. those years. And we've been inundated with the idea of telling parents, you don't have to feel sorry for yourself. You just need to do something about it. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the neat thing about being an advocate is learning from each other and, and learning what her needs are, sharing what my needs are, because they're all different. You have such a wide spectrum. From my son not being able to walk or talk or do anything for himself to the ones who are with the, the Down syndrome uh, who walk and talk, chew gum, and they can think and they can work. And you, you just got this whole spectrum of abilities in between. And so getting all these people together, it's like you learn you're not alone here, and you can help here, and you share your stories, and you share information, and you all get better. And once you become an advocate, I, once you start to speak up for what you know is your truth, the healing starts. And let me tell you, healing is much better than being in that detriment of pain, because the pain can, can really it doesn't just go away. It's continuous as that person grows. If it doesn't meet your standard, that type of thing. But a child that has brain damage and 
mental retardation as it was known then, cannot help themselves. There's a helplessness that goes with it. There's a helplessness with those that you surround them with. And it takes a little bit extra. It's almost like we always have a thing in our advocacy that we say, God had to give us 20 extra extended years beyond what was normal. And now normal is way beyond that. So if we respect, you know, if someone lives until they're 60 or 70, we have to live till we're 90. So we have to live so that we can do what needs to be done. <laughs> we have to be stronger. But yeah. you know what? In our weakest times, we still found the strength. I was president of two parent groups. I don't know how I got there. I don't know who nominated me. I just know I walked in a door, and one day I went into a building. It was called Northview. And my son was, we were supposed to have a meeting with a counselor. And I didn't know who they were. These people were strange to me. And they said, well, he would have to sit in the seat and be quiet until it was our time. And he decided he wasn't going to sit in that seat. So he found the superintendent's office and he crawled up <laughs> under his desk. And once he crawled up under his desk, he found the top of the desk. And he put the papers in such a disarray that the superintendent was just flabbergasted. <laughs> he says, get this kid, get this kid, get this kid. I said, that's my son. Yeah. And I hope you understand that I did not know what my son was going to do, but you don't know him. And I want you to meet Todd. And he said to me, but I don't know what you expect from me. I expect you to be diligent enough to meet me and listen to what I have to say. And from that point, he told me, he said, you know, I really just don't know exactly what it is you want. And I said, then it's time to find out. And that was my first meeting. But I will tell you, I learned from a lot of people that simply said, you don't stop there. You don't give up. You can't quit. You can't send this package back. And you have to keep on going. From that point on, I became a part of some parent group where I didn't know five parents. But those strong parents were teachers and educators. I'm forever grateful for that opportunity. Yeah. Well, my son, when just before his 16th birthday, I couldn't take care of him anymore. So he went to live at Stillwater Center out on North Main Street. Um, they had a great parent group out there. And boy, did we fight to keep that place open. And uh, now we're seeing, you've got your book, uh, Home from Purgatory. They're trying to shut down the few places where my son was able to live now because they want to push everybody into a home in a community. My son could get his services in a place like that. He had too many medical needs. And now we're, we're going backward. That's the, that's and that the fear. scares me yes. for other mm -hmm. people whose children are still here. Because you have aging parents. They can't drive anymore. They can't drive at night. They cannot be involved with their children's care because they have to go two counties, three counties away because that's where their children are. And that is not the way we should be going. We are going backward. And it scares me that there's nobody behind Wynema and I who's going to take up this fight because everybody has to work now. Well, you need two paychecks. And, it, right. and, and, and everybody's losing the community feel of working together, advocating together, Talking Being to each educated other. educated mm -hmm. together, that's all going down We're the thinking tubes. that what they've got there, and so it's going and to be And it's not going to change. And it's not going to change. And it's shrink wrap tie dyed with a bow yeah. on it. And, and it's, it's changing. Right. It's, it's changing. Talk about, we talked, um, uh, we had just mentioned that how the ARCs came about with the families and all, but when it, there was that void in Montgomery County. Talk about the formation of, you're talking about each of you as individual advocates, mm -hmm. but the advocates, the organization, talk about the founding and, and some of the some of the things that you've done how many right. over so many years and why it was important when you were doing it and what those concerns are now because 
who are going to be the advocates mm -hmm. for the future. Right. So well, how, do, uh, how and wh how did the, and when did the, the advocates organization came up, come about? Well, I, I will say this, and you mentioned her, I will mention her as well. Julia um, mm -hmm. was the person in the book that s spoke about her child. And Julia was very avid. And, and Julia and I have been down a long path together, but she likewise felt as though that the ARC had not successfully done what it was to help provide for her child that was no longer here and wanted to do more for her, her other child. And the one thing that I do know is, is that there was a frustration. And some of us came together because in Montgomery County, and many people already know that now, there's a human service levy. And that levy ties our hands to, not hands, but puts us in a position where all our funding comes out of the same pool. And there was a time when I was asked, and I was brought to from a parent group by a, a very good board, ex-board member and advocate, Mary Lou Watts. Mm -hmm. And she is my, my uh, uh, stepmother, and she said, you've got to come go to this meeting. I said, look, I'm sick and tired of somebody not giving me what I need. Nobody wants to listen to what we have to say. Where do I go to get some assurance about my child? I'm frustrated. Mm -hmm. So she took me to a meeting, and she said, let's sit down. And she said, there's about five people that are going to get together. And that was back in 1993. And it happened to be that I sat down in the meeting and just listened. And sitting there, I heard someone say, we can't approach the commissioners. We can't do anything about this funding to get an increase so that we can do more with disability services in Montgomery County. And I'm sitting there, and they said, well, they're not approachable. And I'm thinking, well, they're human beings. And so I've always been a why person, question, why can't you? And they simply said, well, we, have, we want to put together a group of parents that can basically just sit down and speak with one or two of the county commissioners. And that just seemed like it was so difficult because we were making it more difficult by talking about it, but no one had made the move to do it. Well, with the assistance of our superintendent from Montgomery County, and he's great, a good person, uh, father as well, Ken Ritchie, he said, let's start a community committee and see what we can do. And we used to go from location to location in the open facilities that were available, starting with the administrative buildings, which used to be in another location, but going to Northview and trying to make the rounds with other places where parents had small nucleus parent groups. And finally, we made our way around to where providers were interested in what we were doing. We were meeting with the superintendent at least once a month. And once we got together and had four or five meetings, it started to look like we were all starting to say the same thing. Well, I got frustrated because they wasn't doing it fast enough. And so one of the things about it was, OK, you say why, but why not? And so immediately, I started to fold into that. And I met a good person at those meetings. One of them was Tom Weaver. And that is uh, Choices in Community Living director. And in formulating with that, there was also a gentleman that worked with him in public relations with Rich Hopkins. And they were very avid about the idea of let's get something together, put a letter together. And a letter in those days was not what you call in writing. They had come up on something called new, I don't want to date myself, <laughs> called a computer. And everybody at the table, there was five of us sitting around there, say, do what with what? <laughs> you know, you're going to write a letter, we're going to all sign it, and it's going to be a letter. And they said, no. Said, we'll, we'll put the, a letter together with our words. And we found ourselves working together with a small committee. Well, then we took that back to the county boards and simply said, we want to have opportunities to meet with the county commissioners. And they simply said, well, we don't know right now. It's just before a levy. Well, everything was always just before a levy. Yeah. I didn't know what a <laughs> levy is, was. Huh? I didn't know what a had, this together. is levy. Yes. This is levy time, so they'll appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. the levy 12 levies later. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I thought, levy, we got a boat down at the, at the, you know, on the dock. What are we talking about? <laughs> How much money are we talking about? And they said there wasn't enough to provide programming, additional program to take in. 20 or 30 more people and we couldn't no one could give you the numbers so we went back to mr ritchie and we said mr ritchie something's got to be done and so one day he said listen i'm going to tell you that i'm going to have a meeting with them but i want so many people to show up and with the innovative ideas of of younger rich hopkins 
and Tom Weaver, we were able to get together and they said, be here at a certain time in a certain place. And we did. And six of us showed up. But the one thing about it was they weren't expecting us to bring somebody that was our school teacher, our other advocate, and my one of my people that I revere today. And that was Eunice Powell. And we showed up and the county commissioner <laughs> was coming back from lunch. And that county commissioner, who I'm forever grateful for, was Chuck Curran. But at that time, Miss Powell got on the elevator and she was on a cane. And she says, wait a minute, wait a minute, you hold that elevator. <laughs> Well, when she got ready to get on the elevator, I was on there with another person, and three people had gone ahead, and Mr. Ritchie was upstairs waiting on us. And Miss Powell stood in front of the door of the elevator. <laughs> and I thought, oh, wow, she's something else. <laughs> and she says, the door doesn't close until you agree to meet with me. And I thought, boy, she's bold. You know, and I saw what she was doing. She did not let the door close till he said, I will meet with you immediately. We got up to upstairs where the rest of them were. We sat on the couch, and we let her take He took her in his office, and when he came out, he was red as a beet. And she said to him, this, this thing you call a levy, we need more money for our children. She was a staunch advocate before me, long before me, that had a son that did amazing things. And I yes, revered her. Their story is in yeah, the book. Their stories in the yeah. book. Yeah. And I revered her. But she taught me something that never say never if you want it bad enough. And she immediately stepped out, and we left that meeting that day, leaving Mr. Ritchie there, but they didn't expect us. And sometimes you have to do the unexpected. We had to actually almost hold the elevator to get her out of there. It's a funny story, but it's the real deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when you've got someone that's fought as hard, as, such as Mr. Pratt and Eunice Powell, it's an amazing thing, but now you know that their words count for something because today where I am, I'm now in their place looking back, trying to figure out who's going to do it for me, who's going to hold the door. Mm -hmm. so. Who's going to help your son when you're not around to do it yes. anymore? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you, and you learn not to take no for an answer. <laughs> who's going to make sure the money you doesn't just, stop? Coming? They tell you no, you go, why not? Why not? Why can't we have the services that we need? And you just stop taking no for an answer. How do you get families now? Because it, we're, we're honoring the advocates and we're honoring right. Wynema's leadership of it and all. But sadly, the advocates really are not functioning right. today. I mean, you used to have works. You knew elected officials by name. I, I mean, not just county commissioners. Yes. Fred Strayhorn's a, a friend. Yes. You worked on the uh, the legislation that helped get uh, the mental right. retardation word eliminated right. from. Uh, it was on the governor's committee. On the governor's and so, and so many of those things. Right. But that that busy, that always active, that mm -hmm. holding the elevator kind of advocacy, that that you have been through for. 24 years. 24 years. And where Now, are we going to be in that phase again where, the, you know, when they arc and it's just sitting there? But as Sandy said earlier, um, with the talk about Medicaid and, mm -hmm. and all the other con yeah. the mm -hmm. concerns, where does that put put people? We, we thought it, it was done. We got the houses. We got the mm -hmm. nice community. Mm -hmm. We've got people yeah. in jobs in the community. We had Stillwater with with just top notch Waivers services, and better funding, better funding, and uh, person centered planning yes. where where your sons, you know, and or you as your son's advocate could say, "This is the service mm -hmm. I want. Don't pigeonhole me and put me over here because there's right. an opening. Right. This is what I want to do. I want to get a job, and I want to live in my own apartment. Those kind of things." What what does that do to you uh, with decades of this? And you kind of see that, mm -hmm. do you see a void yes. mm -hmm. coming? Yes. And, oh, and how does that feel It makes personally? me sad. It saddens yeah. me because I've had people approaching me in the last two years. The Advocates is 24 years old. It started with those very five, six people around the table. And it was the residential coalition. And at that time, we had one year. We got $1.7 million added to the, the human services levy. But from that point on, we couldn't take it for granted and just think that we're going to fly and we're just going to be able to take this thing and run with it. It was not the advocates for people with developmental disabilities. 
we were fighting to get residential funding for families that needed placement for their children in the event they were not going to be around for them and they aged out of the at that time current program we were able to get a one thousand dollar grant through the brighter tomorrow foundation who was was a funder of ours for over eleven years and they believed in us enough after we got the one point eight million dollars with Eunice's help and the legis I mean the actual advocating of that we were able to move into a five thousand dollar grant within that guideline we were able to along with Fran Watkins and four other people that sat as advocate board members we developed into and I was nominated into that to become their president I didn't know that there was no one else behind me that wanted to come <laughs> along and pick up the gauntlet and help carry it uh, some of them they didn't did. term limit you huh? no <laughs> but we were able to and again coming full, says no. <laughs> coming full circle we were actually a Fran and Rich Hopkins were able to attach to a grant that was provided through the ARC the ARC of Ohio they were no longer ARC they were Ark of Ohio mm -hmm. and giving them kudos for allowing us to come in as a uh, nonprofit and attach to a grant that would provide us our first nine thousand dollars we were able to take that nine thousand dollars and build a, a building block a stepping block but prior to that we worked we operated on we had a spaghetti dinner we started out just selling spaghetti at the Otterbein Church one night and we they cooked the spaghetti and we sold it. We had people come in to tell them what happens, what would happen if families were able to actually talk to each other, come together in a meeting place that you would have a say in, in the tentative changes. It made a lot of things for building a mission statement, a strategizing. Um, someone that's connected with choices, Bob uh, Stoughton was one of the directors that helped to strategize. And we made $75, but that $75 took us to 1000 mm -hmm. You start small and you build, but we didn't realize that our future was going to be so strong. We found ourselves sometimes having as many as six workshops in one month, you know, two or three different meetings with the county boards. We've sat on parent advisory councils. Every time there was a meeting with the county board, we've spoken before county commissions and made a, a big difference. I myself did 18 months on the governor's council trying to work into the governor's strategy and that was under Governor, governor Strickland who listened to us about the word mental retardation of where it had a place in, in the lives of our children that we just found that it was not appropriate to say that's who they are. They're people first. Mm -hmm. One of the things that came out of that was self-determination. Uh, money follows the money follows the person. There was a liberty. There was a freeing up that went with the kind of advocacy we did. We allowed over 1,156 families to get on board. That's what the county was carrying for almost nine years. Don't be exact on those numbers, but it varied. But we had a membership of over 550 parents that were signed on, and possibly 300 that were active. And in those parents, they talk to each other. They learn, like Sandy said, to feel good around each other. It became a family. And unlike what the ARC was doing, we didn't charge families but $10 just to show up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't charge for the, the events and things that we did. We didn't charge for the workshops. But we did have to charge for the special things mm -hmm. that we did for the kids. We had Family Day in the Park. Nine years we created a recreational activity in the summertime, the always in March, celebration. celebrating uh, MRDD Awareness mm -hmm. Month. And it was developed out of, of, a, of a dream I had one night and simply said, let's take some of this money and let it count for the very people that we represent, not just for the families. And in 2003, we were able to grow outside of my home. We were first operating for, at the Ellis Center and we operated at, at Choices in <laughs> Choices in Independent Living, and we moved from there, and we went to the Ellis Center, and they allowed us to be there for, Dr. Betty Young was mm -hmm. one of our catalysts for also helping us to learn through Brighter Tomorrow, and grant writing. She was one of our teachers for grant she writing. Was, yeah. And once we moved from Ellis, we found ourselves getting a $18,000 uh, grant. We graduated. 
you know, and immediately shortly after that, we found ourselves going independent and we were able to get our nonprofit status. We were able to graduate outside of the development plan of the AR of the Arc of Ohio. And we went to represent Montgomery County in such a way that we could stand up to our legislators and they were all well known, but we did some educating with them. Some of them had just come on board. One of the greatest people I've ever met in the legislation was Tom Roberts and under him was Fred Strayhorn. And that young man was amazing because he came on board with the leadership of Mr. Roberts and he was kind of attached with us and he learned and now he represents you know, in, in the uh, representation as far as uh, state representative across Montgomery County. Uh, Roland Winburn was very ad much an advocate. Peggy Lehner. We all became close friends because wherever you'd see a legislator, you would see an advocate parent. And you would see clusters of parents that felt not overwhelmed by talking to them. They're people too. One of the biggest things they used to get upset with me about is go talk to her. She's just another person, but yeah. most of them had a relationship with a child that had special needs. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest things about that, we've always ended every single thing we did on a good note. We had some rocky roads. We had times when people says, I don't want to be bothered with you. Don't continue to call me. Don't contact. But we ran a newsletter for seven years out of my home. But we moved into an office in, of our own in, in 2003. And we operated that office on a $38,000 grant for almost nine and a half years. When that grant went away, it was a choice of the families. We had a graduated board. We had some strong parents that came in. They ran the office. What an amazing story. Mm -hmm. Because one thing about it was we stood firm. We stood firm enough to stand behind a legislation that changed and took words out of the actual revised code and, and the disabilities arena, we were able to put forth a lot of effort to make families count, to make their voices loud. We've done four rallies over a period of 24 years. And we showed up the, at the, and I still have it in my, in my garage, and I'm trying to give it to somebody, <laughs> but there is a banner that had over 1,600 names that we took to the State House and it had a residence in the State House for almost two weeks because of Tom Roberts and because of Fred Strayhorn. It had a place. Our voices were finally heard yeah. and this is what we work so hard for. We are so proud, I stand proud, even though the last two years have been difficult. My son is older now, I'm getting older. I want to release that to someone, but I've looked around and looked in, you know, open closet mm -hmm. doors and looked in other There's places to there. find someone that has that same level of energy. But somebody said, well, I, mean, I don't know where you're getting it. But I said, I'm not ready to quit. So I developed it with the thought in mind. It's no longer just an advocacy, it's a ministry. And if I've been appointed by this, then I still have work to do. And I've carried it on and met with families individually, met with families ongoing, cluster groups and stuff. And we went back to what was started in the beginning, coffee clutches. We still meet up with each other and we still try to talk to each other, but you've got a different kind of population now. Yeah, well, and the big thing too is with all of the grants that the advocates did get, nobody got paid to show right. up and do that right. work. That they was to conduct the, the events. One, once in a while, there'd be a little extra money where we could pay some of the parents gas money. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was not For workshops something, only. Yeah. yeah. So this was not something that was a money-making deal. This was just bread and bread and butter to keep something going. It was an important lobbying and that yes. yeah. And yeah. advocacy. That's what advocacy means is action. And yeah. Well, we I do want to say this. We with we have gratitude for Brighter Tomorrow, who has been, was so strong in believing in us, and it made it feel good because it was local to the county, and a lot of people started believing in us, and there was a level of respect, and. Through that, getting to a place in the state of Ohio, Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council, mm -hmm. where one of the people that's running, the director now, respected us when we walk in the room. But the Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council believed in us enough to get us to $40,000. Mm -hmm. And when it got to fifty, and I said no, parents started to think that there was something wrong with me. <laughs> and I simply said, I just don't want, I can't do it for the money. I'm not paid. Mm -hmm. I've always been a volunteer. 
and I believed in the work that we had done, and I, I planned to stand on that. At one point, we reached um, a lull, and we started saying, where are all the parents? Younger parents felt as though that we owed it to them, that the county owed it to them, that the levy owes it to them, and started taking somewhat what I think is often for granted. But then the teachers stopped teaching, and the meetings got to be too much. There was a lot of things that made change come about, but the change was going in a, in a uh, wrong direction. And I went to the superintendent of Montgomery County, and I simply said, I'm going to ask you for one favor. Of all the commitments of what we've done, please don't let advocacy die. I begged for it. And we did move forward and, and went into a county facility where I did everything I could to protect our, our ana anonymity right. mm -hmm. and to make sure that we still had a voice in spite of the situation of what was taking place around us. And we protected yeah. that all the way up until we decided that we needed to disband it and move into a private sector. And, and we could have gotten grants for a lot more money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the decision was made that if we take this money, we can do more things. But then we become the mouthpiece for the person we've gotten the money for and what it is they think is important. And, and you, you lose you owe you lose to you, them yeah. or something. And, you lose right. your local control mm -hmm. of having meetings and educational Change our mission. Uh, groups to, to, to have people come in and tell them what it is they need to have. So we really never did that. We, we basically used the, the uh, two things. The um, rights, disability rights was a catalyst, mm -hmm. guidelines. We changed wording in three of those to make it fit the very people that we represented. Right. And that was a pride. But our mission statement was very clear. There took, there was 12 people that sat down to put in a mission statement. Five of them were able to carry it forward. But 17 of them believed in me, and I couldn't let them down. I could not let Mr. Pratt down. I read a letter the other day, and it was, it's so beautiful that I'm holding it till the celebration date, that Mr. Pratt wrote from his table, his desk, and simply said, I have a belief that this is the voice of the families that need to go forward. There was Pete Mate that had a belief mm -hmm. that there needed to be strength in numbers. Uh, there was a Bob Wilson who I was frightened of and didn't understand him because of his, you know, his, his, his great voice and the depth <laughs> of his voice that he simply said, somebody better get busy. You know, I remember those words, but I remember when Eunice got up and walked out of a meeting one day and said, you better get it right. And now I could not let them down. I could not in any way. Fran, who was always on the phone with me, always right there always a travel partner back and forth to Columbus when I was just a novice. And I learned something from her. Don't let any disability become your inability to move forward. If you're going to do it, then you do it and you do it right. But don't you give up. You would not, you're not going to quit. And everybody now tells me when I walk into the room with people, and I still go out and speak to some, some small groups, and they simply say, are you ever going to stop? <laughs> You know, because now as a ministry, it's a are different thing. Are you going thing. to take over it and make sure their voices are heard? Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, are you going to go to Columbus again? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, possibly, if I'm mm -hmm. called on, if it need be. But new legislators, avoid. Now, one thing I do want to say real quick, and that is in 2007, we were given funding. And the funding, we decided to make our own video. And we did make a video of four families, and I did all the work myself. And a great gentleman who worked with us in photography from DATV mm -hmm. uh, worked with us for almost seven years. And we formulated a beautiful CD. And we sent that CD to every legislator in the in, in state of Ohio that was brand new. Mm -hmm. And we also did table interviews with every new legislator that came on board. We taught them lessons about this is the person, person first, person centered, mm -hmm. person determined, person that has rights. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing yeah. I think is beautiful. And we went to Columbus and testified I don't know how many times. Yes. Yeah. 
and got other parents to go along. And because she browbeat. <laughs> I can believe that. She browbeat the superintendent to give us a bus right. to, and a driver. I had a to sit down. To, to get us to Columbus. Well, we certainly, on, on behalf of a, of a community, we thank you for, for what you've done. And it's only a, a, a small part of We could spend the next two hours yeah. talking about everything. But that two women could make the impact. And the, the other women you talk about, the mighty women, and the, those mighty strong. Women. And uh, we do hope the community would consider coming in and join us. It's, it's going to be a memorable evening on Go November 9th out. at the Dayton Women's <laughs> Club. And um, again, I just, uh, Home from Purgatory is available at uh, Partners for Community Living. You can give us a call at 898-2220. And as we get ready to, uh, to close, we've talked so much about John Pratt. And, of course, John Pratt and that beautiful face, his story is in here. And I would like to close. Um, my voice can never be his voice, okay. but it's, it's his words, part of his words. And so I, I want to read uh, something from John, and I, I think you'll both relate to it, and, yes. uh, and, and you'll understand what advocacy means when we do this. And, um, uh, again, we'll invite you to read more stories about Eunice and Fran and all of the wonderful people yeah. and be with us to celebrate what a person determined to care for their child and to care for the, not only their own child but other children Thank and young you. adults when they become adults <laughs> and all too. So uh, this part of a story from, uh, that Mr. John Pratt shared with us in Christmas in Purgatory. Well, you know, there was this philosophy. That's great. You build a home for these people, but not in my neighborhood. You know, what's going to happen to my property values? We had to fight that for years, that NIMBY syndrome, yeah. not in my backyard. I had friends, business associates, and they would tell me they just don't like it, these homes coming into their neighborhoods, and they just might move because of it. My philosophy was, gee, sorry. Sorry you're leaving such a great neighborhood. <laughs> There's three things you had to be careful and not argue about. That's religion politics, and the location of a home for people they called retarded. John's efforts spanned a lifetime of social activism, ending up at the time of his death when he was working to build an endowment fund for people with developmental disabilities. He was an activist and an advocate. Most of all, he was the father of four daughters, including Susie. It was her struggles in finding a place where she was welcome that brought this one very strong, determined, and most gentlemanly man to tears. One day, I did something out of meanness, and it stayed with me ever since, he shared one painful recollection. Susie and I were out to lunch at a restaurant. I took her out a lot, shopping at Meyers, and we always liked eating lunch together. Anyway, this one day, we were eating lunch in this restaurant, and there's some woman just staring at her, noticeably staring at her. Susie was getting upset. She knew she was doing it. I excused myself from my wife, and I took up Susie, and we walked over to that lady, and I said to her, now get a good look at this. If Susie stares at you, it's because she has a disability. I don't know what your excuse is, but you're really bothering her. And the lady started blushing, and I think I ruined her meal. Then I sat back down, and it ruined mine, because I shouldn't have done something like that. We don't want anybody's sympathy or pity. We just wanted them to accept us like we're a normal family. No one can ever really know except other families who had faced the same thing. Families like us who have a child and they love that child no matter what. And then to have some doctor or professional tell you she'll never amount to anything. Amen. You should put her in a facility immediately and forget about her. Nobody ever forgets those words. Nobody. That's why we had to do what we did all of us, making sure that there were schools and workshops and homes. That's why sometimes the mean came out in us. We couldn't let it happen again, not to another generation of families. And so from John and Wynema and Ma Sandy and so many others, we, we put out the call. We can't let it happen to another generation of families. Someone has to step in. Someone has to be the advocate. Thank you for joining us for Partners for Community Living and being a part of celebrating two remarkable women and their remarkable journey.